Welcome to Radical and Relevant. It's a weekly Bible study. Uh, my name is Pastor Nick, and I am a retired Marine and full-time missionary on Okinawa, Japan. And uh, I'm, a, I'm an in-your-face kind of guy, but love compels me to get in your face. And so uh, don't misunderstand my, my, my brashness or my, my forwardness and my directness. Um, love compels me to, to not pussyfoot around some things and just talk about real issues. And so if it's political, if it's racial, if it's moral, if it's historical, um, and you're dealing with it today, if it's sexual and you're dealing with it today, these are issues that we talk about. And so we don't, my job is to teach Christians how to be Christians today. And uh, with all the, the drama and the confusion and the godlessness around, um, I, I don't apologize for that. And so the issues we deal with, they're real issues. We're looking for real answers. We're looking for real people, but we're looking for the solutions. And the real solution is Christ Jesus. And so uh, um, I, so there I was. I always start with a little story, you know, kind of um, years ago, I had this very vivid dream. And I was, you ever had that dream where you wake up and it was just so real? And uh, this one was a little scary. I woke up and I was looking around, making sure where I was at. And I was in a mild state of shock. I actually had back-to-back -back dreams that day. I'll share with dream number one right now. And what I saw, it was so vivid, it was so graphic, I thought I was there. And I had to compose myself when I woke up and look back and just kind of review and rehearse what, what the Lord had shown me. It was, more, it was a dream. I know I was asleep, but it was prophetic. And um, what I saw, <coughs> excuse me, I saw a mob of people and they were angrily protesting the shooting death of a criminal. I said a criminal. And um, this, this criminal was caught in the act of a vicious crime by a good police officer. And uh, I am not making this up. I'm just going to tell you what I saw. Take it or leave it. Uh, that's up to you. And so this criminal was caught in the act by a police officer. And uh, what ends up happening, the criminal protested and, and fought and resisted arrest, did not comply, and it escalated. And uh, uh, the criminal ended up getting shot. And he died at the hands of the police officer. Uh, the police officer didn't have a choice. I'm watching this happen. I mean, it was tragic is what it was. Immediately what happened, there was a horde of people coming out of the woodworks defending the criminal. They were absolutely defending the criminal, and they were uh, swearing that this criminal was good, even though he was caught in the act, and they were just act oblivious to the fact that he was a criminal. But they didn't care. They just wanted to uh, uh, defend the criminal. And uh, while they were calling the criminal good, they were calling this good cop bad. And this mob was demanding that the good cop be hanged, literally hanged immediately without a trial. I don't know if you've ever been in a mob, but sometimes that mob takes on a spirit, and when that mob takes on a spirit... You better get out of the way because it's like a tidal wave. You can't stop a mob. And so things were escalating really, really quickly. But see, what really shocked me was I looked closer. And, you know, I was shocked. But I, what took it to another level of shock was I was looking closer, um, trying to examine what was going on. A voice cried out from heaven. There was a voice that rang out from heaven. And the voice said, woe to them who call good, uh, evil good and good evil. And I said, that's Isaiah 520. And... Uh, the, the the spirit that was speaking urged me to take a closer look. And I looked closer, and then I realized this frenzied crowd, they were my friends. A lot of them were my friends. They were my family. And I recognized so many of the faces. And as I was um, looking at the faces, I was shocked. I was stunned. I was like, these are my friends. These are Christians. What are they doing? Because they were attacking the cop and defending the criminal. And I was puzzled. Whatever that voice was, it was an angel, I don't know what it was, but what the voice told me, he says, in these days, even the very elect will be deceived. And I knew that was Matthew 24, 24. And so I'm sitting here looking and I said, well, I have some questions because I asked the voice, why is it woe to them who call evil good? And the voice made it so plain and was very blunt. The voice said, because when you cannot recognize evil, or you refuse to recognize evil uh, for what it is. Evil is loosed. And when you loose evil, good suffocates. 
And I clearly saw evil being condoned, endorsed, embraced, promoted, even in some cases protected by law. And then I asked the question. I said, well, I asked you, why is it woe to them who call evil good? I said, why is it woe to them who call good evil? And the voice responded again. It says, because when you handcuff things like truth, safety, protection, courage, and peace, you bind good. And when you bind good, evil thrives. And I clearly saw good people hesitant and reluctant to get involved because it was too risky. I'm talking about, it, it, as a consequence, crime thrived in this vision. And then what I saw was good cops and good people hesitant, reluctant to get involved because it was like a no-win situation. If they get involved, they're going to be accused. If they don't get involved, they're going to be accused. And... This is people today. Literally, this is people today. People today, including Christians, cannot discern good from evil. I'm talking to a lot of Christians. I'm, I'm going to be on a lot of toes tonight, and it, it's going to hurt. You're going to get a spank in the night. And um, why is it that people cannot, Christians cannot discern, the, at least the world has an excuse. They have no measuring stick of morality. Jesus Christ is the only measuring stick of morality. And so non believers can say, I didn't know even though the law is written on their hearts and on their conscience. <clears throat> but there's no excuse for Christians. No excuse for Christians to be uh, siding with evil over good. And so what, what this tells me is that no one seems to know what is right anymore. Um, individuals, families, and governments, they, they either cannot or will not speak out against and defend good. They won't do it. They won't speak out against evil. And so what's happening in our societies, our society, particularly in America, is nosediving into greater confusion. We're, we're losing life. We're losing property. We're losing principles and morals. We're losing this generation. We're going to lose the next generation. And we're, we're being catapulted into more death. If you read um, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, this talks about the difference in Christians, meat and milk. Uh, the Christian that's still on meat, you're a babe. The Christian, that, uh, the Christian that's still on milk, you're a baby. The Christian that's uh, a mature on meat, he's a mature Christian. And it reads something like, let me see. Um, Solid food for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. How, how are these people on the wrong side? So many of my Democrat friends, I am not a Republican. If you, if you, if you take that from this whole conversation, you're lost too, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I vote Christian values. And so, um, if, if it sounds like I'm bashing Democrats, I am. I could talk about Republicans too. They're spineless. They're godless. But but right now, I'm talking about all the drama that's going on in the U.S. with all the riots and the racism and the protests and Black Lives Matter and white privilege. It's foolishness. And most of everything that I share with you is 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 initiated by Democrats, supported by Democrats. I'm, the Democrats have abandoned God, and they abandoned God a long time ago. And I still have Democrat pastors and clergy and chaplains. It doesn't make any sense. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who cannot discern right from wrong. So the reason I'm bringing this up, because here's the problem. I'll tell you this. I'm going to get to the, 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 the problem and the solution here in a minute. But the problem is, just like in Judges 21-25, um, it reads, um, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's also in Judges 17, 6. But Judges 21, 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did was what was right in his own eyes. This is America today. This is America Day. America, uh, um, people are not acknowledging Jesus Christ as king. Basically, they're living lives. We have no king, which means you have to be king. You have to, you have to live like you're God. That's what Genesis 3 and 5 is all about. If you read that closely, he says, For God knew that if you would partake of this fruit, you would be like one of us. You would have to be as God. If you read that closely, study that thing out. Even uh, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, God bless his soul, he just passed away recently. He's even... Uh, explain this, interpreted this scripture, 3 and 5, Genesis, and he says what this is, is suggesting is that um, as soon as you disobey God, 
as soon as you disobey God, particularly Adam and Eve, you have to become like God. You have to be God because if you if you abandon God's rules and his directions, then you have to live by your own set of morals and standards. And so you have to be like God. And so we kick God out. Who do you think God is now in America? Who do you think God is in America? Now I'm going to tell you right now, the root of the problem, this is still the root of the problem, is blatant narcissism. When people say, black lives matter, black lives matter, that's absolute, the epitome of narcissism. And then they say it's a black thing you wouldn't understand. Narcissist. Self-centeredness. And in a, in a word, it's godless. God is not a part of that. I'll explain very briefly because I've had so many of you ask me things about, um, isn't, it a, isn't it a just cause? Isn't it you know, equaling out? Isn't it balanced? Aren't they out for good? You're a child. You are a child. Let me pray over you real quick, and then we'll, we'll take another step here. And so, Father, I pray over these men and women right now, Lord, and I declare that they remember that you said in Genesis 1, 26, you said, and now we will make human beings, they will be like us and resemble us. And Father, I pray that these men and women, Father, they take confidence that Romans 8, 29 says that you, Father, knew what you were doing from the very beginning, and you decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love you along the same lines as the life of your own son. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that these men and women here, these people here, that they will, Father, look at this Son, Jesus Christ, and see the God who cannot be seen. Father, these men and women will look at this Son and see God's original purpose in everything created. This is in Colossians 1.15. And that, uh, Father, uh, that these people will look at Jesus Christ and see your original purpose in everything you created. Father, these men and women will recall in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 that Jesus is the exact likeness of God and, and, and that the, the visible image of the invisible God, that's who Jesus is. And so, Father, I declare 2 Corinthians three eighteen over these people, Father, that the Spirit of the Lord works continually within them and they become more and more like Jesus and reflect, Father, your glory every day even more. And, Father, I pray that these men and women are confident in knowing that Philippians 2.13 says that you are working in all of us, Father, your children. You're working in us, giving us uh, uh, the desire and the power to do what pleases you. Father, you place the desire in us and you give us the power to walk right before you, Lord. And, Father, I thank you that Colossians 2.7 in your word, you said, you told us, Father, these men and women, you said, let your roots grow down into Christ and draw up nourishment from Christ and that these men and women will see to it that they go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth that they were taught. I pray this over these men and women, Lord. And so, Father, I declare that Ephesians 4.22 tells us, Father, your sons and daughters, to take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside. This is Ephesians 4, 22, 23, 24. And, and, and a life that's working itself into uh, our conduct as God, you accurately reproduce your character in us, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you continue uh, to, to pour into us and teach us how to become a new person created to be like you, Father, truly righteous and holy. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So by way of my schedule, um, the bases are opening up, and so uh, in the four outreaches that we're doing, two of them are open again, the Zebulon Saturday Night Church and the Friday uh, morning brig sexual integrity class uh, I'm doing Monday nights on Facebook but I think next week we'll go back to Bible studies at the Schwab Chapel I know the chapel's open for Bible studies we're just trying to make sure everything's okay and then uh, Wednesday the brig's going to be opening up soon be praying about that we'll go get back to our brig Bible study uh, in the meantime be praying for me because I still want to do these Facebook videos because there's these Facebook live videos there's a lot of you that need this information um, and, and so these, these videos, they're, they're, they're popular and they're being shared. And so um, it's, it's a ministry. And we're always looking for ways to just help folks out. Um, I would encourage you to go to uh, my blog. I post a lot of this information. You know I don't mince words. You know I don't waste a whole lot of time. Um, um, I have a blog where I've posted a lot of my newsletters. They're called Think on These Things, based on Philipp uh, Philippians 4 8. Think on These Things. And um, they're called TOTS. Um, it's at zcdc.wordpress.com, zcdc.wordpress.com. You can read a newsletter in five minutes, three, four, five minutes. Share the newsletter and get that thing out there because it's a lot of good information. 
Also, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Yahweh Has a Son. Go check out the videos out there. Tons of information. Um, short ones, short videos, long videos. Go check them out and share the videos. It's okay. Don't stop being afraid. Stop being you know, forgetful. Stop procrastinating. Share the video. Share this video. Um, also, the last thing. Um, my wife and I, my family and I, we're out here as full-time missionaries. And uh, as full-time missionaries, uh, we totally rely on donor support. And uh, uh, so the work that we're doing is straight up for the Lord. And uh, we, we, we invite you into partnering with the works that are being done over here and making disciples because we, we make disciples very, very quickly. And we, we, we prepare Christians and we make Christians that have teeth, that go out and in love, uh, um, counter all the baloney that's out there right now. And we equip Christians with answers, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. They go out there and uh, they, they push back. They get in the good fight. If you're not in the good fight, stay close. Uh, I'll train you up real quick because God did me the same way. And so there's ways to sow. I'll post uh, in, the, in the comments at the end there are ways to sow. Please pray about supporting these ministries. We need your help. So, um, so let's jump into this. Like I said before, um, of late, because of all the riots and, the, and then the, the incident in Atlanta, Floyd, um, uh, George Floyd and whatever else, and all, there's all these accusations out there about uh, racism in America, uh, our, 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 our history, our foundings, uh, systemic racism, Black Lives Matter and whites apologizing for their privilege. And it's all a bunch of baloney. It's a crock. Um, and it's not my opinion. It's the word of God. And I'll prove it in a second here. Um, so I've had people calling me and, and emailing me and messaging me, asking me my thoughts about the Black Lives Matter movement. Of course, Black Lives Matter. But is this a legit movement? Because they're saying, well, isn't it legitimate? Do they have a, does BLM have a just cause? Isn't BLM just countering systemic racism, racism in the U.S.? And I just want to shout, you know, Luke 12, 56 says, you hypocrites. Jesus said this, you hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you do not know how to interpret this present time? Can you not discern the spirit behind the BLM movement? Just stand back and look and listen and watch. It's so evident that they are not on God's side. It's so evident. Because if they were, here's some questions for you. Um, it's a lot of my friends, you know, I know they're, they're asking kind of in secret because they're not sure they sense it's wrong, but they cannot explain or they don't know exactly why it's wrong and they can't put their finger on the issue. I know this isn't PC. I don't care. This is BC biblically correct. And so here's some questions you need to ask yourself. Would Jesus be a part of black lives matter, uh, their, their agenda and their goals? Could you see Jesus out there, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, and then, you know, spitting on cops? Could you see Jesus torching buildings and, and, and causing riots and inciting violence? Really? Is, is, is BLM pro-black or pro-Christ? You got to think, it's not, it's not complicated. Is BLM's focus on black supremacy or equality for all? It's about blacks. This is why I say a lot of people say it's okay to be pro-black. I don't have a problem with you know loving your heritage, but when your pro-blackness uh, is a, is above your pro-Christness, you you've got a problem. It's called idolatry. Knock it off, man. Is 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 Black Lives Matter walking in black pride or Christ pride? Is Black Lives Matter interpreting their experiences through black lenses? This is what they do. They they interpret everything. I have so many friends that interpret their life through black goggles, like black experience goggles, and they, they fail to see clearly. I'm talking to so many of you out there. Some of you are getting upset right now. I know you are. And, and you get all mad because, you know, well, this is my experience. You, you don't know what I know. And I've asked these same people. I'm talking about doctors, chaplains, pastors, businessmen. And I've asked them, name the most blatant systemic racism example that you can today. And not one has been able to come back with a legit argument. Not one. The best they can do is, oh, there, there's, what about when a cop pulls up behind you? Everybody gets that pucker factor when a cop bits behind them. Well, what about profiling? 
you know, I prof I profile too. You profile too. To say that it's a black thing you wouldn't understand, that's a form of profiling. Uh, is Black Lives Matter manifesting revenge and retribution? Oh, well, yeah. Is Black Lives Matter projecting anger, hate, prejudice, rhetoric, chaos, confusion, anarchy, mob mentality, violence, threats, hostility, uncivility? Stop asking if this is a legit organization. They're not. They're the equivalent of the KKK. Jeez, help us, Lord. Is, is Black Lives Matter exercising deceit and manipulation? They'll lie straight to your face about some things. They're deceiving people, man. Is Black Lives Matter into bullying and shaming and guilting people? You know, they're bullying people. I have so many of my uh, young people today, they're saying that uh, all over their social media and even down to some of the riots, you can see what they're doing. They're telling these people, kneel, kneel. Bow down. And matter of fact, it's no longer time for you to be silent. If you're silent, you're on their team. So if you're white and you're silent, you're not one of us. Are you serious? That's a form of bullying and shaming. And then I meet white people who are guilted into, into compliance. Stop it. And I've got white leaders, white friends, who are white pastors who are afraid to talk about this. And they, they, they're so lukewarm. Oh, I can name names. You know who they are. Golly, they're so afraid to just, just just, call it what it is. Call sin, sin. Stop it. Stop being afraid. Well, I don't want to be offensive. because We do need to apologize for our American heritage. You don't know your heritage. I, that's another conversation. I could talk about that. So, um, <sighs> they're, they're, I mentioned this kneeling. Uh, I saw several videos where, where Black Lives Matter, uh, the, the protesters are, <laughs> oh my gosh, I just saw one today, I've seen it for a couple of days now, where in, in Chaz, something, something autonomous zone, they, uh, there's a video came out saying that uh, the blacks in there, the black leaders in there are telling white people in there amongst them, um, before you leave today, uh, you, as a, as a form of, 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 of solidarity and understanding and and, and 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 loyalty you need to give some a black person ten dollars before you leave today you're a moron you're a pinhead knock it off that's just foolishness that's racism <laughs> jesus <coughs> so they, they told this one cop down in georgia uh last week they're trying to tell him and, and pressure him and bully him into kneeling and the cops like, I'm not kneeling. They said, you can kneel for the cause because you know there's racism in America. Well, racism, that's a two-way street. Everyone's racist. And to, to say racism against blacks is only racism, you're closed-minded. You're a narcissist. And so the cop says, he's a, I think he's a trooper. He said, I'm not kneeling. I only kneel to Jesus Christ. And they said, well, well, okay, you, if you just take one knee, you don't have to bend two knees. Just take one knee. And if you take one knee, you know, you're not worshiping us. He said, I don't, I'm not going to kneel. And then the, the, the leader said, it's okay. One, one way or another, he's going to get it. He's going to understand one way or another. That's a threat. Are you kidding me? <sighs> Where kneeling is concerned, I'm going to tell you right now, you better not kneel to that Black Lives Matter. That's a form of worship. That's a form of idolatry. You might think I'm crazy, but it's the same thing as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were getting tossed into the furnace. The king wanted them to kneel. Read that in Daniel 3, verses 14 through 18. Daniel chapter 3, 14 through 18. He was telling them to kneel. And they said, we, we're not going to kneel before you, oh, oh, great king. We acknowledge your king, but if God saves us, cool. If he doesn't, cool. We're not going to kneel to you. We kneel to God alone. Same thing with uh, uh, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, where Daniel was in the lion's den. The king was wanted to you know, when he heard the, 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 the sound, you were supposed to bow before the king. Daniel wouldn't do it. In Acts chapter 4, verse 17, Peter and John, they were told, stop preaching in Jesus' name. Stop preaching. And they said, which is right in God's eyes? They told the leaders there, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking of what we've seen and heard. I've experienced Christ. And whether, as I experience him and learn from him, I have to share. I, I have to share. I'm free to share. 
And then Acts chapter 5, Peter and the apostles, um, they told the people, we, we must obey God rather than men. And understand this. Do you know that Satan wanted Jesus to kneel? He said, if you just bow down and worship me. In Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, the temptations of Christ. The second temptation, Satan said, <coughs> I'll give you everything if you just kneel down and worship me. You ain't take no knee. You need to know that Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11 says, there's going to come a time when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. And so there's this other thing with Black Lives Matter they started doing recently. They got white people washing their feet, washing Black Lives Matter's feet. And I had a young man uh, ask me, well, didn't Jesus wash feet? Isn't that a sign of, 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 of service, uh, service and humility and, and a, a sign of, you know, just serving somebody else? And again, what's the spirit behind this, this whole ritual? They're washing Black Lives Matter. Uh, um, I don't know what they're called. Team members? I don't know what they're called. They're members. They're, watching, they're washing feet. They're saying, wash my feet, wash my feet, wash my feet. And it's an act of humility and ser you know, servitude. And so um, you need to understand what's the difference between Jesus washing feet. Because we do foot washings. At Zebulon, at our church, we do foot washings. And um, um, <clears throat> when when someone completes their tour on Okinawa, Japan, and somebody is uh, about to, uh, this is their last, say, service or Saturday there at, at, at the ministry, what we do, we do a, a foot washing. And it's very, very humbling. And so me as a pastor and, and other leaders in the church, we, we get down on our knees and we, we do a cer ceremonial foot washing. Now, as we do this, um, I explain what this is about. It's the same thing what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is an example of how you're called to serve. And so what's happening with this BLM stuff is that when, when I do foot washing and when Jesus did foot washing, he said, this is how you serve others. When they're telling you to wash their feet, they're sitting there saying, this is how you serve me. It's not complicated. You just got to have a, a clear mind and, and just kind of say, Lord, show me what's going on here. And so... Um, uh, one ritual says serve others. The other says serve me. This is straight up selfishness. Just serve me, serve me. And you need to know this is a form of lust. It's a form of lust. Uh, Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole wrote a book. I recommend all y'all get it. It's called Maximized Manhood. It was the first Christian book I read um, years ago. And uh, um, great book about manhood. Anyway, in there he talks about the difference between love and lust. He says, love gives, lust gets. And he goes on to explain, love gives at the expense of self. Lust gets at the expense of others. And so this is what this is about, this BLM. They're, they're taking property. They're taking loyalty. They're taking money. Is what the spirit behind Black Lives Matter? That thing is evil. It's disgusting. And if you if you're black and you're getting mad right now about this kind of stuff, you need to repent before the Lord. You're going to be held accountable for for the damage that they're doing. Because if you're condoning it, and if you're 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 promoting it and endorsing it, you're responsible. There's blood on your hands. Yeah, that's real talk. <clears throat> I had a second dream. I told you about the first dream. Now the second dream. As it was playing out, I, I, I want you to know something. Um, these were multiple black protests. I mean, the same night I had a second dream, and uh, uh, there were I saw multiple black protests, and these protests very graphi graphically and eerily uh, paralleled the crucifixion of Christ. And now, when I you remember, the, I don't know if some of you might be old enough to remember this, but we used to have these projectors with these little transparencies, little see-through transparencies. There'd be a picture on the transparency. You'd put it on the on the table, and it would go up, and it, it would project out onto the wall. Well, it's kind of like it was one transparency, and then there was a second transparency. Oftentimes, you put the first one up, and uh, it shows a picture, but then you put the next one up, and it actually complements this picture, and so you get a fuller picture, right? Well, it was something like that going on, because I saw two videos type of things going on in my dreams. In this, in this second dream, I saw, it was like a video of the crucifixion and the mobs of Jesus. And then I saw a video of present-day mobs. 
and they were like running right over across each other and they were almost like word for word same spirit same things were happening same words were being uh spoken and so what ends up happening i'll, I'll try to describe it there were chief priests back then today the chief priests are people like sharpton jackson uh sometimes dd jakes uh our leaders the media these are these are the chief priests of today and the chief chief priests back then and what they were doing, they were moving the people to tumult. If you understand tumult, that's like rage and excitement. You get these people fired up and you're instigating a mess. That's in Matthew 27, 24. Go look it up. The chief priests were only involved for self-interests. I saw this in my dream. These, these two videos were playing. They were only involved for self-interests. That's Matt, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 10. Look it up. The chief priests stirred the people to yell, release Barabbas. In the protest instances, it was an evil, guilty black man. He wasn't guilty uh, because he was black. He was guilty because he was a criminal. And so, but at the same time they were yelling, release Barabbas, this criminal, they were also saying, crucify Jesus. But in this instance, it's a, it's a good white cop. And that's in Mark 15, 11. The chief priests, again, the black leaders, uh, they bullied Pontius Pilate. He's the, he's the, the ruling authority. Um, the chief priests today, they, they bully the, the, the mayors, the aldermen, the, the governors, the politicians, the Democrats, the, the Republicans, the president. They bully people and they threaten people. And so they bullied Pontius Pilate with mass gatherings, threats of violence, and increasing hostilities. That's the entire chapter of Mark. Mark chapter 15, 1 through 15. And then I saw the chief priests, then the black leaders today, they encouraged and fueled rage and violence. I saw the chief priests then and the black leaders of today, they were actually using terrorism tactics of threats, fear, and manipulation. Then I saw a growing demonic spirit of rebellion on the people. This, this, this spirit was just growing on the people. is just increasing in strength. And it was coaxing them and leading them. The people's disrespect, disregard, and disgust for all authority, earthly and godly, grew rapidly. Loud rap music was playing in the background. F the police. As the mob mentality grew, it gained momentum and it, it could not be stopped. Anarchy and chaos was the result. It ensued and it just, they destroyed much. So then, those were my dreams. Now, Black Lives Matter, bad. Very bad. I, I explained that. If you, if you didn't get it, go back and look at the first you know 20 minutes, you'll get it. White people. Y'all need to grow up. I need more white people who comply and say... Yeah, white privilege exists. Uh, if you have, I have privilege. I grew, I'm Mexican American. You know, I'm an American, but I have Mexican heritage. And I didn't. I grew up in the projects, and I had privilege. I don't care who you are. You have privilege. If you have any kind of privilege, that's a good thing. I don't care if you're rich or if you're poor. You still have privilege. What I'm getting at is that any kind of privilege that you had is is not your fault. The privilege you received was a result of your parents' choices. If your parents chose to save money, if your parents chose to stay together, if your parents chose to raise your right, if your parents chose to send you to school, that's privilege. If your parents you know, fed you, if your parents clothed you and housed you and sacrificed their lives for you, that's privilege. There's nothing wrong with privilege. But what's wrong with white privilege, they're suggesting that white is better than black. Y oof. They're suggesting white is better than black. What they're saying, and this, this philosophy, it's, 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 it's destructive, it's demonic. There's no such thing as white privilege. If there is white privilege, I can certainly name black privilege and Asian privilege. But the white privilege they're talking about is whites are better than blacks. Blacks have it so bad. 
and because blacks have it so this is what white privilege when people white people are apologizing for being white or pastors are getting up saying no we need we need to uh, sympathize and empathize with the black community because their struggles been so so tough in america let me explain to you what they just said oh let me translate what they just said my life as a white person is hard but at least i ain't black <laughs> are you serious and black folks sit here and they soak it up. Stop being pinheads. This is ridiculous, man. This is this is foolishness. What they're saying, I'm going to tell you right now. The concept and philosophy of white privilege is condescending. My life is hard, but at least I ain't black. Let's acknowledge how hard his life is. And then, not only that, but let's acknowledge that, as a white person, that blacks are incapable incapable of achieving on their own so let's lower the standards let's make quotas let's do affirmative action what you're saying is that blacks cannot meet the challenges and the standards so that's what white people are doing and black people are saying yeah yeah i'll take that i'll take that getting all these handouts knock it off grow up listen I, let me just make this really really plain <clears throat> when blacks agree with white privilege it's a form of coveting and jealousy i'm gonna say that again when blacks agree that white privilege exists they're revealing a form of coveting and jealousy i wish i could be they, blacks have been polled and asked about being white for 24 hours and blacks are entertained by this, and they jump all over this thing, overwhelmingly. You'll meet a few confident blacks, and I love these people. They're, they're confident, and I'm, I'm black, and I'm proud, and I love Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm okay with that. But those ones that say, oh, man, if I was if I was white for 20, my life, how much my, my life would change? You're a mush for brains. Come on. Stop it. Uh, so <clears throat> let me close. Let me wrap this up. Um. We are the United States of America. That was our name. That was our origins. And we were united. What united us? What was our common bond? Because when the nation was being formed, there had to be an agreement. You cannot form a nation with the 13 colonies and all these different representatives and the people's you know, you, you had to have agreement, a common bond. You know what that common bond was? The common bond was, a lot of people say liberty, freedom, uh, land ownership, and all that. And that has its place. But the common bond was God. I'm talking about the God who has a son named Jesus Christ. The common bond was God. And we knew God. And they, they, God was a part of their daily lives. They acknowledged God. They feared God. They served God, which meant when you, I, I just spoke at a court martial today. I had to testify at a court martial uh, for one of the young men uh, um, uh, um, who's, who's going through rehab at the brig, and we ministered to him at the brig, and I had to testify on this young man's behalf, and I told the court, he's come a long way in a short period of time. This man is, he, he acknowledges his, his mistakes. He has, he's full of remorse. He, he, he takes my hands, and he cries, and he prays. And he asked for forgiveness for the people he's hurt. He asked for the forgiveness for the people who has hurt him. And, and so I testified to this kid's um, rehab and recovery. And <clears throat> the prosecution gets up and starts asking me a question. Um, so <clears throat> how do you know <clears throat> he's not pulling your leg? How do you know? And I said, well, and, and how do you know he's going to do better in the future? And I said, well, I've watched this young man grow. And before, God was not on his radar. But I'm telling you, since his confinement, God is on his radar, and he does not need to walk honorably before mankind. This man's focus is to walk honorably before God. And if he does that, he'll stay out of trouble. And the court, she kind of like, well, well yeah, good point, good point. That's my point here. When we were United States, we had God on our radar. And now, what did I say about Judges uh, 21, 25? There was no king in Israel. And every person did was what was right in their own eyes. 
Today in America, we don't acknowledge God. We don't acknowledge Jesus Christ. And a lot of you fake Christians, you're sitting there saying, Jesus Christ is Lord, but you attack me left and right. So many of you attack me and, 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 and throw the, get rid of the Confederate flag. Um, take, tear down the statues. Oh, when I see Christopher Columbus statues, I'm just so wounded. Cupcake, stop it. You know, other people might, the people that are buying into that rhetoric that you're spewing at them, they're morons. I'm not, you're not, you're not going to get that baloney past me. Grow up. And you Christians that, 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 that are coming at me, you know, trying to tell me, you know, you're not the person I really knew. How disappointing. It is disappointing when you find out somebody isn't who they really are, isn't it? So what has divided us? We've gotten further and further and further away from God. Godlessness. In one word, it's godlessness. The Spirit of God birthed the ideals of, of, of freedom and, 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 and equality in America. These were God-birthed ideals and standards. Have we messed some things up? Yeah. But has, has America tried to improve these things as we go along? Oh, of course. Of course. That's why we keep continue to amend our Constitution. Uh, black rights. Uh, women's rights. Yeah, we, we, we fix it. And so what ends up happening, what has divided us? We've left God. We have no king. Judges 21, 25. Um, many of you Christians are out there. You are godless. You, you Christians, you're godless. I know you're godless because what you're saying has no God in it. What, your arguments that you're making, the accusations that you're saying that you, the white people are racist. I had I had a young lady who told me years ago she didn't like Sarah Palin. I said, why not? She's a racist. I said, where'd you get that from? Uh, 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 who are you voting for? Obama. Why? Uh, the number one reason blacks voted for Obama was because he's black. The number one reason. That's That's racism. And you know what? Oh, man. Ah, I need to repent. Let me read some scriptures to you. I'm telling you right now, there are white people out there right now who are afraid to offend. You better be afraid of God. Jesus came to offend. I'm telling you right now, Jesus said, um, um, he, I didn't come to unite. I came to divide. And Jesus said, that's why I stand for the truth and the truth is going to divide. Um <clears throat> You need to be more afraid of God than you are of people, than you are of politicians, than you are of COVID, than you are of Black Lives Matter bullies. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 7, 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, and I know so many Christians who quote this, but they're not living this. You know who you are. You need to get, don't forget about what I'm saying. Get before the Lord and let God heal your heart, your calloused heart. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If we're going to turn America around, we need God. Oh, Lord, we need God. We need a revival. We need Christians like you and me getting back out there and, and, and praying and loving people with the truth. Not being a pansy. You don't have to be a pansy to be a Christian. You don't have to be, you know, you know, slapped and, and kicked and knocked down and shot. You can defend yourself. Taking a stand. That's another subject. So I got so many Christians. They knew. I had one guy, dude, years ago. He said, because uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Second Amendment. You know, I'm all about the right to bear arms. And I had a guy years ago actually leave the church. Um, uh, probably about four or five years ago. He left the church and he said, um, yeah, yeah, I don't want my, uh, I don't want to. You know, promote any any kind of violence. I said, I'm not promoting violence. That's not what guns are about. Guns aren't about just violence. They're for protection. That's what Jesus told his his disciples. You know, go and sell what you have and buy a sword. It's for protection. It's for defense. And so he said, well, in 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 a, in a crisis situation, because I asked him, I said, what are you going to do in a crisis situation? He said, well, I I I would pray. Like if your car was caught in a mob and they're beating the mess out of your car and it's dangerous and your family, your wife and kids are in the car, what would you do? He said, I would pray and trust the Lord. I said, it's good. I, I respect that. But I would pray and trust the Lord too with my pistol. And I say, Lord, I pray that you help me with my aim. 
You think I'm kidding? Then some of you are going to have a problem with that. I'll deal with it. So that's where I'm at. <sighs> Galatians 3.28. There's neither, see, you know why I'm, I'm, I'm like that? Because I'm not stupid. I know that evil exists. Evil absolutely exists. A lot of you are afraid to call a spade a spade. Some of you say, I can't believe you use spade. Triggered! I'm not talking about blacks. There was, a, there was a time we could say that without you being so triggered and, you know, cupcake. But... It was a time when we called what it was. That's wrong. It's a sin. And and then we didn't we didn't tolerate it. But today people are afraid to be offensive. The word of God is offensive. You know it, and give it to people. Let God deal with them. And then, then we'll turn things around. If we're gonna we, if we want to turn things around, you're gonna get we have to get God back into our lives, into the individuals, in the families, in the communities, in the states, into into our nation. The only thing that's going to save us is Christ. He's the solution. We need a revival. Because I can ask you this. See, here's the question. I ask people this all the time. Is America confused? Is America lost? Is America in pain? Is America dying right now? And everyone agrees with this. But then I ask, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? I got a Facebook post. I tweeted something. I changed my profile picture. You can do better than that. Stop being so fake and lazy. <clears throat> Galatians 3.28 There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's our, that's our commonality right there. That's where we come. That's where we unite. In Christ Jesus. That's the common bond that needs to come back. We're the divided states right now. Right? But we can get back to the United States if we go back to God. Um, I want to read Galatians, I mean Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne. And before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Did you see this? He says, I had this vision, and I saw a great multitude, which no one could number. And there were people there from every nation, every kindred, every people, every tribe, every tongue. And they were all there sitting there worshiping God and the Lamb. See, some of y'all are going to be surprised at who's in heaven and who's not. Listen, God doesn't stop being God just because we discarded him and left him behind. He's still God. But we're living the fruits of that right now, aren't we? We're, we're, it's godless in America right now. You and I, you know what I'm saying is true. We need God back. So pray, repent, and start with yourself. Start with yourself. Stop seeing through black lenses. Stop seeing through white lenses. Start looking at the world through Christ lenses. Help us, Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How cool is that? How cool is that? So, um, look, I know this stuff is controversial, and I'm not PC, and you shouldn't be PC either. That's the problem. You've been PC. Americans have been PC for far too long, which is why they get away with this. Our job is to stand flat-footed, not be afraid. Be, I fear the Lord. And, and just love on people with truth. If you love people, you give them the truth. If you love people, you will give them the truth. The truth is the Word of God. If I'm talking to you, if you love yourself more, you will be silent. Do you really love God's people? Do you really love God? Then do what he told you to do. He said, go and make disciples. Go and share the gospel. And if you don't know the gospel, stick close. I'll show you how to teach, I'll, I'll teach you how to share the gospel. It's really simple. Yeah, but it's powerful. Okay. I love you guys. Let me pray this over you, and then I'll close. 
So, Father, I thank you that in Colossians 4, 2, Father, you told us, Father, you told these men and women, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and thankful hearts. Father, and I pray, Lord, that you give all these men and women many opportunities to speak about your mysterious plans concerning Christ. And I pray, Father, that these men and women will proclaim this message as clearly as they should. And I declare that these men and women, Father, that they will live wisely among non-believers and that they will make the most of every opportunity. They'll spend their time wisely. Father, I thank you that their conversation is always gracious and attractive, so they have the right response for everyone. And I declare, Father, Ephesians 5.15, that these men and women, Father, that they look carefully at how they walk, not as unwise, but as wise. These men and women make the best of the time, best use of the time you give them, because they know the days are evil. Father, I thank you. You are not, these men and women are not foolish and that they understand your will, O oh Lord. And Father John 9, 4 says that, Father, these men and women will quickly carry out the tasks assigned to them by the one who sends. That's Jesus Christ. And because these men and women understand that night is coming, that's a time when no one can work. It's getting darker. So they work hard. And Father, I thank you. I can pray Jude 1, 3 over them, Father, that these men and women will defend the faith that you have entrusted once and for all to your holy people. Colossians 3, 23, Father. Father, that these men and women work heartily for the Lord and not for men. And that they know that uh, that these men and women, they know that they're going to receive from you, Lord, an inheritance as their reward. Deuteronomy 13, 4, Father, I thank you these men and women serve you, Lord God, and they fear you alone. These men and women obey your commands. They listen to your voice and cling to you. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Father, I declare these men and women, they're steadfast. These men and women are immovable. These men and women always abound in the work of the Lord. And these men and women know that their labor for the Lord is never in vain. Fill them with your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the last thing, as I close, I would like for you to share your thoughts in the comments. Share your throwbacks. I mean, throw it, throw it back, man. I'm, I'm all ears. Um, and share this video. Stop being afraid to share the video. Get this information out there. You know it's good. People need to hear it. It's controversial. And I know you're probably afraid. Get over it. Get involved in the good fight. So as you get ready to go, I love you guys. Hope to see you guys again soon. Uh, give someone a high five and tell them and mean this. Jesus Christ is Lord.